And let's read from Daniel chapter 4. I'm going to start at verse 4 and go through 27. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me so that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. The magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me. He was named Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth. Bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field, let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will, and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw. And you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for the Spirit of the holy gods is in you. And look how Daniel responds here. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, And his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, And seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O King, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness. 
and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. So that's our passage today. And there's a lot going on here, particularly with Nebuchadnezzar the king and what God is doing in his life. And there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from him. But today I want to focus on Daniel and how Daniel responded here. And notice in verse 19 there that Daniel didn't answer right away. It says that he was sitting there for a while and his thoughts were, were distraught. He knew the meaning. It said he was dismayed. He knew exactly what was going on and what this interpretation meant, obviously, because he was dismayed. But he didn't answer right away. He waited for the right time. There was a timing involved here. In the Bible, in the wisdom literature, it says in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 7, it says, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. And in Proverbs 15, 28, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. So the righteous ponder how to answer. We don't just respond right away, just with negligence or, or thoughtlessness. We think and consider how to respond in the best way. And that's what Daniel was doing here. So he was waiting for a right time to give this bad news about this dream that he had. And Daniel was dismayed at the news along with the king. It says that at the beginning of what we read here that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and it says it made me afraid. So Daniel shared this dismay with the king. He knew the king well and he was sensitive to the king as a person. The king wasn't just somebody that he was serving. He actually cared about the king. And so what dismayed him dismayed Daniel as well. And I do want to point out one thing here. He was not dismayed because King Nebuchadnezzar was a really nice guy or that they were really good friends. In fact, on the contrary, Daniel is essentially Nebuchadnezzar's slave. Daniel is not in Babylon on his own accord. He was snatched from his home, from his family, from his homeland, and brought all the way to Babylon, put in a place where he's never known before, with people he doesn't know, and he was made to be Babylonian, taught the Babylonian language, their literature, he was given a new name, Belteshazzar, that we read here. He was basically uprooted and put in a whole new place to be a slave to King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was not a really nice guy. It even says in verse 27 at the end, he says, Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. He's calling him to repent there. So Nebuchadnezzar is not a nice guy. They're not good friends. And yet Daniel still is sensitive to him and cares about him. We're told to love our enemies. Christ told us to. Look at the screen here and let's answer this question together. Is it enough then that we do not kill our neighbor in any such way as murder? No, by condemning envy, hatred, and anger, God tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to be patient, peace-loving, gentle, merciful, and friendly to them to protect them from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. This is, this is what God calls us to do. Daniel and the king were not good friends, but Daniel is still looking out for the king's best interest, and Daniel obviously cares about the king and his well-being. And Daniel's first sentence in his reply shows care and compassion. I'm just going to read that one more time here. My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. He kind of sets up the interpretation 
This is not going to be a good interpretation for you, O king. Daniel's response here shows that he had soft edges. Soft edges. I'll kind of go into a little bit more about that. But Daniel is not out to prove himself right. He's not out to show off what he knew. You know, yeah, you said that I have the spirit of the gods in me and I can interpret all kinds of things. Yeah, I got another one for you. Look at how great I am. No. He was not happy to be the bearer of bad news. Daniel knew his audience well. And he knew that it would be bad news to him. He knew how it would sound. And so he wasn't just handing over some news. He handed over the news in a sensitive, compassionate way. He had soft edges. He wanted to soften the blow of this bad news here. He had soft edges, but he had a firm center. He had a firm center. He wasn't going to mince words on what this news was. Daniel was honest and he told the truth. As much as this news was bad news for the king to hear, he didn't try to water it down. He didn't try to cut corners on it. There were some pretty sharp corners on this news. He didn't try to cut those off. He made it soft, though. But he didn't water down the content. He told the truth. God's message to the king was terribly unpleasant. Just to review a little bit, that tall tree that was in that dream, that was the king. And he had great splendor. And all kinds of animals found shade. And there was fruit from this tree that was for everybody. Because Nebuchadnezzar was, you know, the great power at that time. And he was providing food and shade and shelter to everyone at that time. But the bigger they are, the harder they fall, don't they? The king is the high tree. But he's not the most high. As somebody who's very high in the world, maybe the highest in the world, it's easy to kind of think, hey... I'm doing pretty good. When we're at our highest and our best, it's easy to think that we're unstoppable. You know, for those of you who are older, when you look back into your young days, you kind of remember thinking that you're invincible and that nothing's ever going to happen to you and you did things that were kind of reckless. And if you're and if you're still young, then you won't realize that you think you're invincible yet. You will though. But the Most High would cut down the king's splendor. All of that splendor is going to be brought down. For that matter, all of our splendor could be brought down in a moment too. Just We are one phone call away from having bad news that could cut down everything that that we are. His pride would lead to his fall. He would go insane. He would live like an animal. It says seven times, maybe about seven years. It's probably a good way to understand that. When we make idols of ourselves and our own success, when we put that high on a pedestal, when we think that this is all us and that it's just our talents, our skills, our intelligence, or maybe even just our good luck, then we need to be cut down to be built back up again. Kind of like when there's a bone that is broken and it heals incorrectly, it has to be broken again and be set right in order to be healed properly. When our success goes to our head and we are built up in ourselves too much, we need to be cut down so that we can be built up again the right way. Jesus in Revelation 3.19 says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Sometimes the bad things that happen to us, such in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, are to build us back up right again. Sometimes the, the pain that we experience is because there's a bone a spiritual bone in our body that's healed wrong and it needs to be broken again so that we 
can be built back up rightly. So that's the bad news for, for the king. Daniel spoke the truth, but had care and compassion and timing in his delivery. So he had truth that was unpleasant, that was painful. But he delivered it in a way that was going to soften the blow. So just for an illustration here, I, I, uh, I talked with uh, Matthew Bronkham. Matthew, would you come on up here? Matthew's one of the uh, black belts in my Taekwondo class. And uh, he's, he's been practicing martial arts for how many years now? Ten. ten years. Okay, so for ten years, we have somebody here who knows how to throw a good punch. He's done it many times, and he knows how to throw a good punch really well. I've seen him break many boards, and yeah, this guy knows how to punch. So if I were to ask him to punch me right now, I would be a little apprehensive about that, wouldn't I? <laughs> so if, he, if I was going to ask him to punch me right here, just, just, for, this, just for fun, punch, give, me, give, me a, give me a decent, uh, not, a, not a hard punch, but <laughs> I mean, this guy could break ribs, I know that. Just do, do a... Do a regular punch, like a regular middle punch. Okay, good. And that was nowhere near as hard as you could have. Okay. So, when you do a punch, one of the things that, that we, we teach is that you want your arm to line up just right, and you want your fist to be level with your arm, and you want to hit with these two knuckles right here. So that when you're throwing your punch, you throw your your hips and your shoulders into it as well. When you're throwing your punch, all of this force and push is ending up in right on these two knuckles. So you can break bones pretty easily with a punch. So what I would like, and when, because we in class actually care about each other and don't want to damage each other, we have punching gloves. Would you put at least one of those on there, whichever one you prefer? And uh, we have chest pads. I won't go through all of it and tying it right now, but now, now Matthew can punch me pretty hard. And it's the glove there and this chest pad here is going to soften the blow. Okay, maybe, maybe up here. Okay, so it softens, it softens the blow, so that even though he was, he was, how hard were you punching that time? 70%. 70%? Why don't you go 80 or 90? <laughs> I could take a little more, because it's, it's padded, it's soft. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> That got the wind knocked on me just a bit, <laughs> but not too bad, because there's padding. Thanks, Matthew. It softens the blow. Thank you. So, firm center, but soft edges. When you care about people, you make it a little softer as you as you can see that he did. And to make sure, you, you put some padding on it so that nobody gets seriously injured, even though I did lose my breath a little bit there. <laughs> he knows how to punch. <laughs> okay, so back to the message here. Like Daniel, we live in Babylon. If you were here a few weeks ago, you remember this. In the United States, we worship other gods here, and there's a lot of people who would claim to worship Jesus Christ or the true God, but if you look at what they actually believe, you see that they don't really worship the Jesus Christ and the God that is revealed in the Bible. Most people, even people who say that they're Christians, 
say that the best way to find yourself is by looking within yourself, not to God or to the Spirit or to Scripture, but within yourself. That people should not criticize someone else's life choices at all. To be fulfilled in life, you should pursue the things you desire most. The highest goal of life is to enjoy it as much as possible, not to serve the Lord or anything. People can believe whatever they want as long as those beliefs don't, beliefs don't affect society. Even 61% of people who are Christians in this country believe that. And that these aren't just people who call themselves Christians. These are people who go to church regularly and say that religion is very important in their life. And even any kind of sexual expression between two consenting adults is acceptable. I mean, we just read, do not commit adultery. But 40, 40% of people who call themselves Christians believe they're going to heaven and say religion is very important in their life and they go to church regularly, say that that's fine. The United States is not Israel. It's not the kingdom of God. It's Babylon. And in this country, we worship other gods. We worship gods of our own making. The gods of feeling good, feeling good about yourself, and getting along. And that's the bottom line. And the gospel message that Jesus Christ came to save sinners and that we need to repent and change our ways, the gospel message is unpleasant in Babylon. The gospel is a solid place to stand, but it has rough edges. It's a great foundation, but it has some rough edges. It says that the world is weighed down by its own sin. It says that we as individuals are weighed down by our own sin. And it says that God's judgment is coming and every wrong act is going to be called to account and that we can't save ourselves, we need a Savior to save us. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. And we can't just continue on in our sins. This is what's killing us. We need to turn away from these things. We need to not look within ourselves. We need to look to Jesus Christ for help and guidance to find ourselves. So when living in Babylon, we need a firm center. We need a firm center because in the world that we live in, we can easily pick up wrong ideas about who Jesus is and what God is about and what God's truth is. Even from fellow Christians. We might have a temptation to water down what the Bible says. There's some sharp edges in what the Bible says and because we might want to get along and to feel good and to make others feel good, we might want to cut some corners. But we need a firm center. We can't cut those corners. Those are not our corners to cut. Don't cut corners on God's truth. Those edges are there for a reason. Sometimes we need to be cut down a little bit so that we can be built back up right. So when living in Babylon, we need a firm center. When living in Babylon, we also need soft edges. Because the truth has some sharp edges. It hurts sometimes. You can use the truth to really cut somebody down. But don't cut corners on God's truth. Pad them. Pad them. In 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, In your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Always be prepared to give a reason and an answer. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Always be ready to give an answer, but do it with gentleness and respect. The gospel has some rough edges. Let's pad those, those edges so that people wouldn't be cut down all the way, but that they would actually receive what we have to say. One way to do that is, like Daniel did, wait for the right time. Wait for the right time. 
there's always timing in truth. If there's somebody who's just experienced a, a major tragic loss in their life, it might not be the right time to say, God's in control and He has a plan. Not that that's false, but that might be a, a sharp edged truth that's not really helpful at that time. Wait for the right time. I'm reading a, a fascinating book right now called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. It's about a man who was raised Muslim, very strong Muslim household, very devout, and he became a Christian. And he's talking about this whole process, how he went from devout Muslim to follower of Jesus. And he has some fascinating things to say about having a firm center but soft edges. So he talks about David, the guy who, who really witnessed to him. David was a Christian with strong convictions who had spent the previous five years of his life studying the Bible and learning to follow Jesus. Even though the gospel was his passion, he did not bombard me with his beliefs straight away. The discussions arose much more naturally after we became friends and in the context of a life lives together. In fact, I was the one who brought it up. The right time. So David waited for the right time to witness. Daniel had served King Nebuchadnezzar well for many years already. By the time we get to chapter 4, he had been with Nebuchadnezzar for quite some time. He had built up trust with Nebuchadnezzar. And when you're a blessing and benefit, people know they can trust you. So as Christians living in Babylon, we need to be a blessing and a benefit to our neighbors. We need to be known as the people who show love and kindness and respect. People who will be ready to help whenever there's need. We need to be those kind of people. Because then, when we have to deliver some truth that has some rough edges to it, and it still hurts even with the padding, they're going to still receive it in the right way. We can't be off in our own corner doing our own thing and just shouting at the world and condemning it from, from the side. We need to be there, and we need to be ready, and we need to be willing and helpful to be a blessing. When I was on vacation a few weeks ago now, we were in Williamsburg, and we were just touring the area there, and when we were there, there was a guy with a, a bullhorn. And he was shouting at everybody about how they needed Jesus and they needed to turn from their sins and Jesus died on the cross to save them from their sins. And, and everything that he said was true, but it wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right way. It wasn't in the context of a relationship. It wasn't in the context of trust. He was saying true things. But if I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but if I don't have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. We need, we need a relationship that's based on love and trust to deliver news that's rough to hear. You need trust to share sharp truth. You need to have that trust because the truth hurts. And we need to tell it to each other and not be afraid of hurting each other because sometimes we have to. It says in Proverbs 27, Faithful are the words of a friend, profuse, or excuse me, faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. In one translation it says, Blows from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. You need to be a friend with trust to deliver the blows that are needed sometimes. Again, seeking Allah, finding Jesus. He says, the gospel requires a radical life change. It's not just accepting something. A radical life change. And not many people are about to listen to strangers telling them to change the way they live. On the other hand, if a true friend shares the exact same message with heartfelt sincerity, speaking to specific circumstances and struggles, then the message is heard loud and clear. Effective evangelism requires relationships. There are few exceptions. 
So we need to demonstrate love before sharing hard truth. We need to demonstrate that we are loving and that we can be trusted. We can't just throw out hard truth at a bunch of strangers. That's not the right time and it's not the right way. So as I was reading this book, David says to Nabil, that's the author's name, I hate to say it, but it seems like when we talk about our faiths, you just try to win the argument instead of honestly looking for the truth. It's as if you presuppose that Christianity is false, said David. Nabil responds, or he said to himself actually, if anyone else had made these accusations, I probably would have walked away and avoided further discussion. But this was my best friend, and I knew he cared about me. I considered his words carefully. We need a firm center and soft edges. That was what Christ did to us. When Christ went to the cross to save us from our sins, He did two things in that one action. Christ on the cross was both condemnation of sin and an ultimate act of love. In that one act, He did two things. He condemned our sin, which is hard for us to hear and hard for us to accept. But He also showed some incredible love at the same time. He had a firm center and He had soft edges. And he loved us. And because of that, we can trust him. As we live in Babylon, let's have a firm center and soft edges like Daniel, as as well as our Lord Jesus Christ. And let's bow our heads and pray. Lord God, our Father in heaven, Lord, help us to have a firm center grounded in your truth, but also soft edges so that people can accept it and receive it. Help us to be a blessing, to show your love, so that, Lord, we can convey your truth even when it's difficult to accept and even to give. We pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen.